All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Archaeological Research Facility. In case I don't know any of you personally, my name is Lucy Gill, and I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology at Berkeley and one of the brown bag organizers this semester. Before I introduce our speaker and panelists for today, I will begin with a land acknowledgement modeled on the statement developed by the Native American Student Development Office in partnership with the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. We consider this a working formulation to be replaced with language reflecting the particular position of the ARF community and developed in collaboration with appropriate stakeholders. The archeological research facility sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people, that every member of the ARF community benefits from the continued occupation of this land and that it is our responsibility to support indigenous sovereignty and hold the University of California accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. So before I introduce our speaker and panelists for today, just a couple of announcements. Next week for our brown bag, we will be joined by Professor Ben Blackman from the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology here at UC Berkeley who will speak about tracking domestication syndrome evolution in sunflowers using ancient DNA. So please join us for what sounds like a, a really fascinating talk. And join us also next Thursday at noon for a talk in the Ancient Nubia series entitled Decolonizing New Kingdom Nubia Through Its Ancient Material Culture by Dr. Renan Limos of Cambridge University. So without further ado, today we are very fortunate to hear from three esteemed guests. Dr. Randy Haas, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at UC Davis, and Dr. Meg Conkey and Dr. Ruth Tringham, both Professors Emerite of Anthropology here at UC Berkeley. First, Dr. Haas will speak about his recent archaeological discovery and meta-analysis that challenged the man the hunter hypothesis and provide evidence for gender parity in big game hunting throughout the Americas. Then our panelists will discuss the surprising media response to these findings including articulations with gender equity efforts, conservative backlash, and hyperbolic depictions. As always, feel free to put your questions in the YouTube chat, and I will ask them to our speaker and panelists. So thanks very much, Randy, Ruth, and Meg. Take it away. Okay, um, I guess I'll go ahead and, and get started. I'll share my screen to get going here. Just a moment to get things organized. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm just going to be begin with a, a brief uh, uh, disclaimer out of out of respect for those who might find images of um, human skeletal remains offensive. I'll, I will note that this presentation does include uh, imagery of human remains, which are central to the argument. Um, uh, all research was conducted in collaboration with the affiliated. Uh, community, IMR community of Muya Fasiri and in accordance with Peruvian federal cultural resource law. Um, but if you do prefer to not view these images, please feel free to adjourn and, and contact me to receive a version of the presentation without uh, burial images. And my, my email address is listed here if, uh, if that's the case. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to um, acknowledge uh, the lands uh, that, are, that pertain to this research. Um, uh, the, the central case study that I present comes from the lands of uh, the IMR community of Muya Fasiri, located in Puno, Peru. Our field station was also based in the community of Todorani, also in Puno, Peru. Um, and members of these uh, communities collaborated in this research. Um, at this particular moment, I happen to be presenting um, from the sovereign lands of uh, Wawia Tanong, um, also known as Detroit, the homeland of the Three Fires Confederacy, uh, granted by the Ojibwa, Odawa, Potawatomi, and Wyandot nations in uh, 1807 through the Treaty of Detroit. Um, and of course, a lot of this research was, uh, was carried out um, at my home institution of UC Davis, which is um, Potwin land. Uh, associated with three federally recognized Putwin um, tribes, the uh, uh, Kachil Dehi Band of Winton Indians of uh, the Calusa Indian community, um, Klitsil Dehi Winton Nation, and Yocha Dehi uh, Winton Nation. Um, last but not least, um, thank you um, 
Meg, uh, uh, Dr. Meg Conkey and, and Ruth Tringham and the Archaeological Research Facility uh, here at UC Berkeley for inviting me to talk to you today uh, to share my archaeological research. My, my name is Randy Haas. Uh, I'm an archaeologist and assistant professor of anthropology at, at UC Davis. Um, and today I'm going to present to you my recent research on uh, female hunters of the early Americas. Uh, following on a, a series of, of conversations with Drs. Conkey and, and Tringham, I, I want to uh, do something a little bit different than, than I um, have typically done when presenting this research. Um, actually, actually published this research back in November, but since then it's received a, a range of, of responses in the media. And Drs. Conkey and Tringham and I have talked a little bit um, about this and thought it would be interesting uh, to interrogate those responses a bit. Um, so what I'll do today is I'll first present uh, an abbreviated version of the findings, uh, then I'll briefly respond to some of the, the media critiques, I'll highlight some of the media applications of the findings, and finally I'll discuss some of the hyperbolic depictions. Um, as you'll see, I, I struggle a bit to make sense of it all, um, it's still rather fresh. Um, so at that point I'll give the floor uh, to Drs. Conkey and Tringham to offer some of their thoughts on the media response um, and provide some broader uh, theoretical uh, perspective. So this story begins at the archaeological site of Willa Maya Pata, which is located in the interior high Andes mountains of southern Peru at about 3,800 meters above sea level. Um, this is a cold, oxygen-starved, resource-poor landscape that challenges human survival. And this is why I conduct much of my empirical research there, um, to understand how people solve those adaptive challenges. And I'm particularly interested in forager societies how the first foragers of the region brought subsistence, technology, and social organization to bear on those challenges, and how those adaptive strategies later paved the way for um, the endogenous, uh, endogenous agricultural economies that would emerge there and eventual um, state formation. In, in 2013, I was working at a middle archaic site called Soromikayapata, a site that was discovered in the 90s by Dr. Mark Aldendurfer and shown in the background of, of this photo uh, here. And while I was working there, um, uh, my IMR colleague, Mr. Alvino Pilco Kispe, uh, introduced me to a site on his agricultural land that was nearby, um, which later came to be called Willa Mayapata. Uh, here's what the site and the landscape look like today. In the foreground, you can see our excavation trenches, which, which um, roughly define the, the site boundaries. And you can see that the landscape is a vast treeless plain. It's dissected by rivers and streams and, uh, and flanked by mountains. Um, the linear striations that you see in this landscape are agricultural plow tracts. Today, IMR communities grow potatoes, quinoa, and barley here. And when uh, Mr. Pilko Kispe showed me the site, I became immediately intrigued uh, by a dense surface concentration of projectile points um, including early, uh, many early forms, which I, I recognized in this an opportunity to study the earliest archaeological culture known to inhabit the region between uh, about 11,000 and 9,000 years before present. Now, at the time, my research was focused um, on, was not focused on that early time period, nor did I have permits to, to work or excavate at the site. But then in, in 2017, I was hired at UC Davis and with the opportunity to uh, take a new research direction, I, I made a beeline for, um, for the site of Willamaya Pata. And in the summer of 2018, I initiated an excavation effort. Um, and during that first uh, excavation season, uh, uh, approximately 30 centimeters below the surface, just under the plow zone, we, we'd occasionally encounter these dark ovoid stains like you see here in this image. Um, and these are cultural pit features. Uh, they, they're darkened by ash and tell us about uh, the presence of, of human activity. Th that season, we excavated about 12 pit features, uh, five of which contained six human burials in total. The burial locations are shown here on the map on the right. Um, all of these burials were concentrated near the center of the site. Individual one was an adult male associated with two projectile points of uh, forms that date sometime between about 9,000 and 7,000 years ago. Uh, the next four individuals that we excavated were not associated with any, any grave goods, at least not any that preserved um, to the time of discovery. Um, and this general lack of grave goods was what we, what we expected among this relatively, what we perceived to be a relatively egalitarian uh, forager population. 
And this is why individual six, the six individual that we excavated or, or WMP6 was particularly surprising to us. Uh, burial six was located about a meter below the surface. Uh, they were immediately recognizable as an adult individual, ceremoniously laid to rest in a semi-flexed position on their left side. As you can see in this image, the, the bone preservation is rather poor. Much, has, much of the bone had long ago uh, disintegrated, um, but parts of the cranium, teeth, and leg bones were, were intact, and sufficiently so to make out the, the layout of the individual. And here, here you can see a, a drawing of the burial. And uh, what was most unusual and, and actually exciting about this individual was this concentration of 22 stone artifacts that were neatly stacked near the individual's hip. And this stacking of artifacts indicated to us that these artifacts were likely um, contained in a perishable bag at the time of death, a bag that had long since disintegrated. And here's uh, what the tools looked like after they're they were cleaned up. Um, the tools were very clearly related to a big game um, hunting economy. Six projectile points were likely used for dispatching large game. Um, you can see those uh, projectile points here, um, one through six. Um, uh, and they were likely used to dispatch uh, uh, species uh, such as vicuña and taruca or an Andean deer. There were a series of flakes um, with and without retouch, were like, which were likely used for butchering animals. Um, there were two well-made end scrapers, which were likely used for um, detailed hide working. Uh, there were three large choppers, which may have been used in butchering, coarse hide processing, or bone working. Um, there were red ochre nodules uh, and, a, and uh, small burnishing stones that were likely used in, um, in hide tanning. Um, clearly, this was a toolkit geared towards a big game economy for all aspects from dispatching the animals to processing the animals. Uh, also interesting was the fact that this individual was permitted to take so many artifacts with so much remaining utility to the grave, suggesting that, um, th that they had garnered an unusual degree of status uh, within the community. Uh, this tool association led us to identify the individual as a hunter. Uh, this photo actually shows the moment uh, when the burial was completely uncovered. Uh, there was considerable interest and everyone had, had, had gathered around um, the excavation to discuss the, the, the finding. Um, and I remember the, the conversation quite well. It, it went something like, like this. Um, he must have been a great hunter, a, a warrior. Maybe, maybe he was a, a, great, a great chief. Um, and in hindsight, um, I imagine that some of the crew members in the back of their minds were going, hmm, he, right? Okay, maybe. Um, and to be fair, uh, I don't think our hypothesis at the time was an unreasonable one. Intuitively, um, we considered that the individual was simply the owner of the toolkit. Artifacts that accompany people in life uh, tend to be those that they, they use, uh, it, objects that they accompany them in death tend to be those that they used in, in life. And while burial treatment is indeed a, a complex, culturally contingent phenomenon, the intuition that grave goods reflect an individual's activity actually has empirical support. Uh, the one systematic study that I'm aware of was conducted by Lewis Binford, who examined the human relations area files. And, and he found that, uh, quote, most common were differences in the types of goods disposed of with the body. These differences were related to sex differentiated clothing, personalities, and tools which symbolize male female division of labor. Such distinctions frequently cross cut additional ones made with regard to other dimensions of social persona, such as membership, group affiliation, social position, et cetera. Um, so following this logic, this one empirical study that seems to support the idea that tool associations are the um, uh, reflect uh, tools used in life, uh, we interpreted WMP6 as a big game hunter. Furthermore, we assumed that the individual was male, which made sense uh, given observations made in forager ethnography. If we look at forager ethnography, we see a strong division of labor uh, pattern. Uh, several studies show that female labor tends to be focused on gathering plant resources um, or small game uh, hunting, while male labor is focused on big game hunting. And so strong is this ethnographic pattern that the, um, the forager anthropologist, Dr. Robert Kelly, uh, recently highlighted it as the one behavior that he thought transcended nearly all forager societies. 
Uh, he says, uh, quote, after I wrote a book about modern hunter gatherers, a colleague asked me if there was anything about them that I thought could be extrapolated back in time. Very few things, I replied, but one was the division of labor. Among living hunter gatherers, men hunt large game and women collect plant food, small game and shellfish. The reason is that they often have breastfeeding children with them and small children are not compatible with hunting, end quote. So our initial model seemed, um, seemed quite reasonable. Our initial interpretation of this individual being a, a male big game hunter. But things got really interesting um, uh, back at the lab. Uh, my bioarchaeologist colleague, uh, Dr. Jim Watson from the University of Arizona, who's shown here um, in the background of this photograph, tentatively identified the WMP6 hunter as a female now, Jim was really cautious about his interpretation at the time, noting the, the poor preservation of the skeletal materials, uh, that they did not allow for a competent sex estimation. But he did note that the skeletal structure fit most closely with female variation um, uh, in the populations that he looked at in that region. Uh, Jim also determined that the teeth of the WMV6 individual were from, uh, reflected a 17, nine, 17 to 19 year old uh, individual at, at the time of death. Um, Jim's a really fantastic bioarchaeologist, so while the, the interpretation was tentative, um, it was clear that we had to take it very seriously and, and um, follow up with other analyses to see if uh, his tentative uh, identification uh, was accurate. And good fortune would have that at the time I had been working um, with a forensicist, uh, Dr. Glendon Parker at UC Davis. And, and Dr. Parker had recently developed a technique for accurately estimating the sex of individuals using a type of sex-linked protein called amelogenin protein that occurs in dental enamel. Uh, this, is a, this is a really exciting um, technique because it applies to the part of the skeleton that is best, best preserved. And it's, um, and it's more resistant to degradation than, than DNA. So for those of you who are interested in the efficacy of this, this approach, I, I'll direct you to a 2020 paper in Scientific Report that was uh, led by Drs. Tammy Buonacera and Glendon Parker, which compares this method to more traditional osteometric and, and DNA approaches. Now, when Tammy and, and Glendon examined the WMP uh, amelogenin proteins, they confirmed um, uh, Dr. Watson's uh, female sex estimate. So at this point, we realized that the, the, uh, this hunter was actually a, a female. Um, so this created something of a uh, conundrum for me, uh, shamefully. Um, in my effort to sort of reconcile this observation with the man, the hunter model, I, I initially imagined, I supposed that the, the Andes was an exception uh, to, the, to the rule. Um, this is cool, I thought. Uh, I, was, I was working at, at Willamaya Pata to study highland adaptation. Maybe broad participation in hunting was part of the adaptive solution in the highlands. Um, so on the one hand, I thought that I'd potentially identified a rare exception to the man, man the hunter rule, uh, either an anomalous individual or an, an archeological culture that deviated from, from the norm. Um, on the other hand, I was also quite aware of the perils of, of projecting the present onto the past. Uh, many of you know uh, the seminal 1978 paper published uh, in American Antiquity by Dr. Martin Vopes, in which he referred to such analogical reasoning as the tyranny of the ethnographic record. And he urged archaeologists to let the past speak for itself rather than to assume it. After all, uh, the human past covers, you know, some 50,000 plus years. Uh, it seems unwise to let the last 100 years of ethnographic behavior stand in for all of the diversity of behaviors that could have existed uh, in the past. And in addition, there were a number of scholars who had proposed theoretical reasons to suspect that prehistoric forager organization may have been fundamentally different in the, in the past. Um, First of all, uh, uh, in the deep past, big game would have been more abundant, uh, human populations lower, and so uh, big game would have comprised a more important part of early human diets, which would have compelled more people to participate in big game hunting. Um, uh, several scholars, including Madeline Goodman and Todd Serval, have shown that actually high uh, mobility, which would have characterized these early populations, actually favors um, uh, big game hunting and broad participation by males and females. 
Uh, Sarah Hurdy has famously shown that alloparenting is an important part of our species evolutionary history and frees up females to participate in, in hunting um, theoretically. Um, uh, other scholars have shown that cooperative hunting was likely an important part of our species evolutionary history. And this comes out of work by Michael Tomasello, uh, Mary uh, Steiner and, and Stephen Kuhn. Um, and then uh, another um, interesting study by Dr. Bridget Grund has shown that um, technology may have played an important role. The major technology of the time would have been the, uh, the, at, the atlatl or, or spear, throwing, spear thrower. And, uh, and Dr. Grund has um, argued that the, um, the use of the uh, atlatl would have been more in inclusive um, for, for interesting theoretical arguments that I, I won't go into here. Um, I, since that, though, there has been brought to my attention another paper that refutes that one. But um, nonetheless, it's an, it's an interesting, interesting idea that, that there may be a technological um, com component to this. All right, so there's this theoretical alternative at the time. Um, and now I'm kind of confronted with, with two possible explanations for this, um, this observation of a female hunter burial in the Andes. Either it's an exception to the man the hunter rule, or, or that um, in, in this time period, maybe everyone was, uh, was participating in hunting, or, or hunting was a, a, a broader phenomenon. Oh, I forgot to step through those as I was mentioning them. Well, those are the different um, uh, uh, reasons for expecting this theoretical alternative. Um, so the next thing I did at this point to help to try to resolve these two, um, two possible explanations for the empirical observation was to look at published data from, from other sites throughout the Americas, um, published burial data throughout the, the Americas. And given the, the man the hunter model, um, what I expected to observe was that outside of the Andes and in the Andes, uh, well, outside of the Andes, that males were preferentially interred with, with big game hunting tools. Um, but given the alternative model, this sort of uh, anyone can hunt alternative, what I expected to observe was that females and males were, were just as likely to be associated with big game hunting tools, or, or at least nearly so. Um, so I compiled from the literature, uh, the data that you see here, um, well, or this is a partial um, representation of the data. Um, I found that there were 427 um, burials individuals um, uh, in North America, uh, predating 8,000 years before present. Um, and uh, from coming from 107 archaeological sites throughout North and, and South America. And I, I constrained this analysis to any um, burials before 8,000 years before present. Um, and this, this meta-analysis led to three key observations. Um, the first thing I observed was that uh, a systematic bias in how burials tended to be interpreted in the past. Um, for example, one study of a Pleistocene uh, burial claimed that, quote, since the burial has been determined to be a female, the inclusion of a projectile point preform has been difficult to explain. However, if the artifact, artifact had been used as a knife or scraper, typically women's tools, then its inclusion with the burial is a more consistent association. Now, I observed several instances of this kind of reasoning. And to be fair, this, this might have been a, a perfectly reasonable interpretation for any single burial. However, our, our uh, meta-analysis afforded us a, a broader view of, uh, of the phenomenon. Um, and we tried to take an objective approach, which did not permit the sex estimation to influence our interpretation of tool functionality, um, nor tool type to influence our interpretation of sex estimation. And when we did that, when we um, counted up all the burials for which big game hunting tools were associated with individuals in which sex could be estimated, um, we observed the following. We observed 27 individuals from 18 archaeological sites uh, throughout the Americas associated with hunting tools. Uh, 11 of those individuals were female and 16 were male. This translates to a 40-60 ratio which is actually statistically indistinguishable from statistical parity from a 50-50 ratio. Um, and when we do a, a, a binomial probability analysis, what we find is that um, somewhere between 30 to 50% of these individuals um, had to have been female in order to produce the archeological sample uh, that we see. Um, so in the end, these data supported our second model, the hypothesis that early females were, were big game hunters um, uh, in the Americas uh, between 12,000 to 8,000 years before present. 
Now, IELTS is often the case in archaeology. Uh, not all observations are clear cut. In fact, most are not. Sex estimations uh, and artifact so associations were sometimes tentative or, or dubious. Um, so what we did was look at just the secure observations, those burials for which sex estimations, artifact associations, and dating were secure across the board. Um, and when we did this, only three individuals uh, were left standing, confidently associated with big game hunting tools. Importantly, none of those individuals were male, uh, and all three were female. Uh, also importantly, two of those females were, were infants from the Upward Sun River site in Alaska. So they were not hunters per se. Um, last time I checked, infants, infants cannot hunt. Um, uh, and so, but I'm gonna return to this point in a moment because this comes up in the, the media response. Um, and so the only adult individual left standing is the WMP6 uh, female, uh, which is the most secure observation of uh, a hunter burial in the, in the sample. Um, so in sum, whether we took the most liberal or conservative approach or anything in between, and we, we sliced this many different ways, um, we always got the same answer that females comprised a non-trivial portion of the sample. So we therefore found support for, for our second model, this idea that females were big game hunters in the, in the early Americas. Um, there are many more details uh, in, uh, related to the study that appear in the article published in the November 4th issue of Science Advances. I've left out our isotopic research, faunal analysis, et cetera, um, um, in order to make some time to discuss uh, the media response to these findings, but I urge you to have a look at the article if you're interested in, in some of the um, more nuanced uh, analyses or some of those other analyses that we did. Um, so what I'd like to do um, at this point is to discuss um, three aspects of the media response. I want to discuss um, some of the criticisms of the study, um, some of the applications of the findings to contemporary conversations, um, and uh, some of the hyperbolic depictions that have, that have um, appeared in the media. I was able to derive a lot of this information um, about responses from the article's uh, altmetric page. Um, this is a, for those of you who are not familiar, this is a page that automatically compiles media mentions of, of an article. Now, as I mentioned uh, a few moments ago, um, one, of the, one of the criticisms that I saw in, in a lot of media, media responses was the inclusion of the Upward Sun River burials in our sample. Clearly infants were not hunters and so cannot be considered as evidence of, of female hunting, um, so the argument goes. But I, I actually want to um, suggest otherwise. Uh, this, this is actually a picture of me as a young child and, and my dad is in the, in the background. Um, my dad's a hunter. It's an important part of his identity. And clearly he thought that it should be an important part of, of my male um, identity as well. And I guarantee uh, that if I had a sister, uh, they would not have worn a coonskin hat or been posed with a shotgun in this way. Uh, yeah, that's a shotgun. Don't judge my, my parents. They're, they're really good, good people. Um, this association of a male child and hunting regalia is undoubtedly related to Western society's gendered understanding that hunting is a male activity. So it doesn't seem unreasonable to assume that hunting tools with the Upward Sun River females similarly index that society's association between females and hunting. Um, in fact, uh, a really great study led by uh, Lou Levy and, and Ellis Davies shows that in, um, in hunter-gatherer societies, quote, learning begins early in infancy when parents take children on foraging expeditions and give them toy versions of tools, end quote. So in this sense, um, I would actually argue that infant burials may be an even stronger indicator of gendered labor practice uh, in the past than adult burials. So I, I maintain that the evidence is consistent with female and male um, big game hunting in, in the early Americas. Um, another interesting critique that uh, appeared in the media, not, not so much with the study per se, but with its reception was leveled by um, Dr. Christine Lee uh, at Cal State uh, University in Los Angeles. In, in an interview that she gave to um, Atlas Obscura, she observed that, quote, I think it takes um, rugged archaeology men saying this to make other uh, older men with establishment listen. Um, this, is a, this is an interesting critique, and honestly, I, I, I'm not going to refute that, that critique, and, and maybe this is something that we can, 
we can discuss further in the Q and A. The idea that um, it took a certain demographic publishing this to to get um, certain uh, scholars to to listen. One of, one of the most common criticisms that I've heard relates to the illustration that we produce. Now, I, I worked with, um, with UC Davis scientific illustrator, Matthew Vertolivo, um, to produce this. And I think he did a really uh, remarkable job and he's received quite a lot of praise for his, his representation. However, many have come to me and said, you know, hey, Randy, interesting finding, but did you really have to put her in, in pink clothing? Um, and uh, um, others have wondered, you know, like, why is she wearing pants? Like, there's no evidence of pants in the Andes. Why is her hair sticking up in that funny way? Why, why is she wielding that kind of funny, funny looking atlatl? Now, um, I want to assure those critics that our illustration is, um, is carefully anchored in archaeological and ethnographic observations. We worked really hard um, to make sure that that was the case. She's shown wearing tailored leather clothing. Uh, which is consistent with the finding of end scrapers, as well as rock art depictions um, and theoretical work by Alden Durfer, which suggests that tailored leather clothing would have been critical to early um, life in, in the highlands. The color of the clothing is perfectly matched to the red ochre nodule found in the WMP6 toolkit, which you can see here on the, the left side. Um, I think Matt really did a remarkable job of, of, of matching up those colors. So she's not wearing pink, you know, she's wearing ochre colored clothing. Her hair is similarly based on rock art imagery, which you can see on the right, um, the imagery showing um, uh, what appears to be either hair standing up in the back or, or headdresses. We chose to interpret that as, as um, hair. The atlatl is based on camelid bone atlatls that have been found in cave sites um, from the Southern Highlands. And you can see some examples of those archeological examples on the, the upper left image there. Um, and the projectile points are based on the forms that were found in, in the WMP6 toolkit. So all of these design details are actually documented in the supplement to our, to our article, which, I, which I'm glad we, we did take the time to add that information to the supplement, and you can um, look at those there. So now I, I know that certain details will certainly prove to be wrong, um, but I believe we've made a, uh, been as faithful as possible to the archaeology. Um, and the concerns that have been raised are, are probably more of a reflection of observer bias than, it, than any bias on the part of the illustration team. Um, you know, but I've thought about this a lot and nonetheless, I'd still like to pitch the question um, to the audience. Maybe this is something we can talk about in the Q&A. You know, should we have catered to contemporary stereotypes when, when creating this illustration? Um, should we have accepted those stereotypes over imperial, uh, empirical accuracy? You know, what, is, what is lost in that process, I think is an interesting question. Um, now I'd like to highlight some of the ways that the findings have been taken up in contemporary conversations about gender. Uh, Forbes magazine writes about uh, potential implications for corporate environments um, with the title, Don't Blame Gender Inequity on Our Ancestors. Ancient women were big game hunters too. Uh, in, a, in a similar Twitter thread um, that I recently read, a woman who we'll, we'll call Frances commented on, on gender bias in um, caregiving practices today, stating that, you know, if society wants women to choose to be carers, it must recognize their valuable work. Instead of giving benefits, pay them a living wage and occupational pension. And in response to that, um, a tweeter named Tim, we'll call him, says, yes, but, evol but evolution, men were hunter-gatherers and women were home raising gardens and cooking and women evolved to have more emotional ties to kids and family and men don't have those emotions because they were killing animals all day. To which Francis responds, that is BS from beginning to end. And then she cites the female hunter's paper in, in science, science Advances. And Tim comes back with the, classes, with the classic, I know, I was just being sarcastic, LOL. Um, another uh, application of the findings that I came across um, was provided by a Salish uh, storyteller um, and author and artist, uh, Kim Senklip Harvey, who blogged about the findings. Um, she says that, uh, she notes that I think we can derive from this study, well, I think that what we can derive from this study is the factual misinformation that the imperial state fed us about what we can do because of our history of where we come from and who did what. In school, the whitewashed history I was being told was that men do all the providing, which is super wrong town. 
Um, so these are these are a few of the ways that the, the findings have been been applied to various conversations in in the in the media. Now, last but not least, I want to call attention to um, to some of the hyperbolic depictions that have appeared in the media. I, I don't want to criticize these outright at this point. Um, on the one hand, it, it kind of pains me to see uh, interpretations extended uh, well beyond the scope of the evidence. Uh, on the other hand, I understand that theoretical that the theoretical pendulum sometimes has to swing swing far in in one one direction. Um, so let's take a look at a few of these uh, hyperbolic depictions. One one common characterization is to paint a picture of ferocious uh, hunter warrior women. Uh, a New York Times uh, headlines, for example, uh, was titled, What New Science Techniques Tell Us About Ancient Women uh, Warriors? Um, Artnet News uh, similarly, similarly declared that the most ferocious ancient hunters may have been women as often as men, a new archaeological finding uh, suggests. Um, now, to be clear, uh, our article has never made any claim about the sort of about ferocious personalities or, or, or warrior behavior. Um, but there you have it. This is how some some uh, media have have uh, taken up the findings. A, a rather disappointing headline actually appeared in um, in Archaeology uh, magazine. I had a really nice conversation with the author um, Marley Brown, who asked a, a lot of great questions. Um, so I was taken aback a little bit when the article appeared uh, with the headline uh, "Lady Killer." Uh, while this this title is intended to highlight the the female as hunter, it really evokes the, the common uh, usage of the phrase, which is to refer to a male who is irresistible uh, to females, which I worry detracts from uh, the female center finding. Uh, and the specific use of the term "lady" further, I think, diminishes the finding as uh, you know, as it's an antiquated term that really indexes a cultural system with strong um, um, gendered biases. Um, uh, I, I tried to make sense of why why that happened, um, and uh, I looked a little bit into this. I saw that the that Archaeology um, magazine, that the um, the editorial board of Archaeological magazine, is is rather homogeneous. It's all males. I suspect if there was a, a female. Uh, more diversity really on on the editorial board that um, a title like this might not have might not have gone through. So I think that really speaks to the importance of um, of diversity in in these kinds of positions. Uh, finally, uh, France TV intends to include the findings in a documentary titled um, "Lady Sapiens," uh, which I think is more focused on the on the old world. Um, again, I suspect that uh, feminist scholars might find the use of the the term "lady." Uh, problematic, though it's less clear to me whether or not this is going to be a problem in, in French uh, culture. The, the trailer for the documentary, which you can actually watch on one of the um, links that was included in, the, um, in the, one of the announcements that was sent around, shows a series of intense and dramatic and highly realistic CGI um, imagery. And when I first saw that, I, it, evoked, um, it evoked scenes of uh, the popular movie Avatar, uh, for those of you who are familiar, you know that that Avatar, uh, the movie, was was heavily criticized for racist depictions and a, and a great white savior kind of narrative. Um, so on the one hand, I didn't want the findings, um, the Willem Iapata findings, to be associated with that kind of narrative. On the other hand, I didn't want to miss an opportunity to share the findings with a with a broader audience. Um, so I actually reached out to um, Dr. Meg Conkey at that point for her thoughts um, as an authority on Paleolithic archaeology and feminist theory. Um, and she actually put me at ease, uh, noting that, that, that the documentary team did include um, a feminist archaeology uh, scholar, Dr. Uh, Sophie uh, Debon, uh, who, who would proceed cautiously. Um, and, and Dr. Conkey advised that it was probably worth the risk in order to, to share the, the findings uh, more broadly. And I, I concurred. So. Um, so I went ahead and shared some of that imagery and some of the um, the figures from our paper and um, some photographs and and some information with the the documentary team and well I you know it remains to be seen how how that how that turns out. Okay, um, so some concluding thoughts as I um, as I open up uh, for Dr. Conkey's and Tringham's thoughts. Um, I want while I'm kind of giving you my concluding thoughts, I want to show you a video clip. Um, and I don't know if you can hear this, if this noise is, uh, if it makes for a noisy background, but I wanna, I wanna play this as I sort of discuss some of my final thoughts. Now, the analysis that I have presented is, is consistent with a hypothesis of non-gendered labor practice in the early Americas. 
I want to acknowledge some of the reservations of some scholars, noting that indeed that the findings are not a slam dunk. They rarely are in archaeology. Um, nonetheless, the theory and the data align quite nicely. And I would argue that the best model is one in which females routinely participated in big game hunting in the past. Uh, the media analysis highlights some rather extreme positions. I suspect that Western society's hyper-masculinization of hunting actually drives that polarization of responses. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about both the more conservative responses, those that reject the findings and conclusions altogether, and the more liberal responses, those that portray the female hunters as fierce killers. Um, I imagine that prehistoric hunting scenes actually looked more like this Ayamara Vicuña uh, drive that I participated in not too long ago. I did observe some, some interesting moments in this, uh, in this drive, um, but it was largely a, a low energy affair. Women, men, and children all participated. Um, so I see no reason why labor practice in the past could not have been more fl quite fluid, um, vary varying as um, ecological and social context dictated. So with that, I'd, um, I'd like to take uh, um, uh, to end by uh, taking a moment to thank the many people who, who made this research possible, not the least of which, um, not the least of whom are my colleagues of the community of Muya Fasiri in, in Peru. Um, thank you, and I'll go ahead and um, turn it over to the, the panelists for discussion. Great, Randy, that was fantastic. Um, and uh, maybe I'll, <clears throat> I'll start here since we still have about um, <clears throat> 10 minutes. I wanna thank you so much for uh, bringing this forward, for stepping back, taking a critical approach uh, to the world. And uh, thank you also for your empirical rigor in everything going right down to the illustration um, and uh, for drawing on what we can know um, as best we can. So, um, I think also, um, you know, I would just make a couple of comments and then maybe Ruth has a few, but to say things that I do find the Forbes article to be really particularly helpful um, in the sense that the author basically argues that we don't need to blame the presumed past <clears throat> for sex differences <clears throat> for today's inequities. And then even more so, I think one of the problems of these stereotypical notions about what the human past was all about in terms of gender roles, besides ignoring the probability of enormous variety and diversity and situational cir circumstances, and I have always maintained that in these foraging, small scale foraging societies, flexibility as to who did what had to have been the case. Um, to have rigidity, rigidity in, in roles of who could do what um, really probably was not very adaptive uh, under any circumstances. But I, I find that these uh, stereotypical roles also, and this, this is you know, extending things a little more, um, <clears throat> what goes unsaid is that it, they also actually not only underwrite um, that such things as gender inequities are natural, but and that women are therefore, you know, it's our evolutionary history that therefore women shouldn't have access to this, that, or be the CEOs or any of these other things. But on the other hand, it also underwrites things like male violence. Um, and I think that, that exactly that men have a notions um, that are just as difficult to overcome as uh, these notions about the inequities of females. Um, and I think um, the whole notion that we have as the Forbes people talked about, an evolved psyche that goes back tens of thousands of years as an excuse for contemporary behaviors is really the, one of the most problematic things. And that was present in all of these responses and even probably guided some of your own work, which pursued, and I think the idea of doing the meta-analysis uh, was fantastic. Um, and lastly, I'll just, and then I'll turn it over. I, I think one of the things we also see in these media responses, and I've had interactions with journalists about a lot of articles that have been published and things that they will take up and they won't take up. They, they will, they won't take up things that they can't turn into a big general picture. They really, 
even if it's in the details, in the local, in the situational, they want it to be a bigger general statement that they can make a proclamation about uh, uncritically. And they also, as I think Ruth will highlight, really don't take into account and help us communicate that archeology span is full of ambiguities and that we really have to understand rather than there being definitive answers and that this is the way it was. Um, so I think those are at least a couple of comments. So Ruth, go, from, go for it. You're, you're muted, you're muted. Time, okay, thank you, Megan. Thank you so much, Randy, for that great talk and for all the um, preparation stuff you gave us. Meg, of course, has just stolen all my thunder. She's, as <laughs> usual, got there first. But I will say that it was very interesting um, looking at the media responses to yours. And the sub there's a subtext here that I think Randy was bringing out and a couple of, of the journalists also brought out um, pretty, pretty interestingly, that is um, the one who uh, Annalee Newitz in the New York Times that she's just written this book about archaeology and is more, uh, she had a big long discussion with me about Chattel Huyuk and so where I gave her many hours of my time about just that, about ambiguity and being not being able to make any particular um, truths and that um, what you have to do is to really celebrate the variability of possibility, possible interpretations, and the, the fact that archaeology is ambiguous, the archaeological data are ambiguous, and that you have to have a rich imagination in order to think through various, um, various scenarios, and that you in order to do this, you have to look at the sort of more intimate scale of events rather than um, taking the easy way out, which is what Meg was describing, which is to think of things at a very large scale, a global scale or a swath of prehistory scale in which you can say something because you, everything is very blurred there are no details that have to be thought through so that you can bypass all that variability and make a big kind of tr uh, picture of the truth. And that's apparently what the public want. And I've always wondered, if it, is it really true that that is what the public want? I really think it's not. I think what becomes interesting is when, for instance, Randy talks about the, the details of that particular grave and shows us the details of that particular um, hunt or not a hunt, but a, a kind of drive of the animals there. That was a wonderful, um, wonderful video, a really telling video. So there were a couple of the um, journalists that brought that out, which is really refreshing to know the Forbes, um, whatever she was called, Kim was it? One of the Kims. And, um, and Annalie Newitz, who can't really get very far away from her searching for the truth, but at least did write some stuff against essentializing or stereotyping prehistory. And um, the others where we're, we're still enmeshed in the traditional story or the traditional way of thinking about men versus women or men do this, women do that idea is just so disheartening that I see the French, for instance, the French uh, video and game is just a development out of Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, um, she was the great heroine. She could do anything. She was, she was as aggressive and as dominating and using her strength for bashing people around as any of the prehistoric people that are being imagined by the Amazons or the these, whatever it is, this um, lady killer, but also uh, whatever the title of the French 
movie Lady, is Lady so Sabian. awful. Lady I've, Sabian. I've, I've subverted it into my <laughs> lower reaches. But um, there's just one thing that I want to end with, and that is I wanted uh, Randy, I was first not sure why you put in the art guy, and then I realized that they were involved in the image, creating that image. But, and I, when I saw the pink one, the pink version, I thought there's something wrong here. She's got this very ladylike, it's a kind of her, it's, it became, I realized what it was in this ladylike -like stance. When I saw your picture, I don't know if you can show it to us again, your first image in black and white of the sketch. Not only is it less precise, it's more kind of almost surreal. It's a more that one. Yeah. She's there um, and it's, it's kind of, there's something more flowing about her, more kind of free. In the pink one, she's kind of still a bit tense. That's my feeling. And um, what, I, what I wanted when I saw the pink one and I actually thought, and now I see this black and white one, I think even more so. What I really want in that picture is a male hunter near her who's fallen in the ground by mistake. He's tripped up <laughs> because she's a much better hunter than he, he is in this case, in this story. So that creating a story out of it is what this is or this that it's at that point that you can begin to realize, you know, this perhaps is a very special woman or if she's just one of many who are in that, in that community. But it, each one of them is different. Each one has specific qualities anyway. And that's how we get out of, uh, out of stereotyping and into a celebration of ambiguity. That's all I have to say. Right. Well, I think we probably need to take some time for some questions, but I just wanted to say one of the things that I thought also is very interesting about this kind of a presentation is not only do we get the presentation of the archaeological research and its context and so forth, but then we get to see the afterlives of our research because each, each and every project has an ongoingness and an afterlife in the public, uh, in our own discipline and, and so forth. So I think looking at these afterlives is, is, is really an, an interesting thing. So thanks, Randy. And so Lucy, let's turn it over to you and you can do a, the moderation of the questions. Sure, thank you all again so much for this wonderful talk. I've, I'm sure like everyone listening have been following this story since it was published. And so this has been really exciting to hear, as you say, Meg, not just about um, the, the research itself, but also about um, the, the media responses that I've also been, been seeing. Um, so very cool to have that all synthesized. Um, so the first question is from our own Nico Tripsevich, who says, thank you for an excellent talk um, and is wondering about the evidence for um, ochre staining on leather clothes, um, whether, whether uh, leather would retain ochre staining. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, in my experience, um, I've not come across leather in, in any of the contexts that I've worked in, but I haven't really worked from rock shelter context. It would be interesting to um, talk to some other folks in the Andes who work on that. But um, one interesting observation, though, um, that I think maybe you're getting at, you're sort of wondering, like, you know, you really like some direct evidence that 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 ochre was used in hide tanning, right? Um, well, there's a recent paper by um, Kurt Rademacher um, and some of his colleagues, which publishes a um, uh, some a burial assemblage from Kunkaicha rock shelter, which actually has some um, hide scrapers with uh, with just a lot of just, they're just caked in in red ochre. Um, so I think that's a pretty good uh, direct evidence for for the use of these um, uh, for for the use of ochre in, in hide tanning, along with the the observation of the ochre and the hide scrapers co-occurring in the, the WMP six individual burial. Um, and there's really great ethnography in Africa. Of um, and some great videos. Um, um, I think it's Catherine Weedman has published pretty extensively on um, on uh, ochre use and hide tanning in, in Africa. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of evidence for ochre on on scrapers in Paleolithic archaeological sites. So it's and it's well demonstrated um, chemically. 
uh, that the, that ochre is really effective as a way to sort of tan uh, hides. So I, I think that's pretty strong. Yes. Um, thank you. I have a question actually of my own, which um, is sort of general for, for all three of you. Um, you know, especially for those of us who are early on in our careers, um, have not yet had any projects that have had this degree of media um, involvement. Uh, what advice do you have um, for sort of anticipating, especially sort of maybe more conservative responses, um, or as you've described, some of the misapplications of your research? I'm sure that is also, you know, both inter both great to see people involved in it um, and reading it um, from all walks of life, but also I'm sure can feel kind of disheartening if you, and um, I don't know, I would be concerned about feeling like I've also lost control of the, of the narrative a bit. So yeah, just what advice do you have for, for handling that? You're sure. muted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but there's no way of bump it, jumping in when you're silenced. Oh, well, did somebody? <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that one of the things that uh, my main response to um, any journalists getting in touch with me is to go immediately into Google and see who they are and to what, ex what kinds of things they've already written and what their background is and what their, how, why they might be interested in what you're doing. If they're just doing it, I'm not particularly, um, keen to meet with journalists who really are not well prepared themselves. I don't know if any of the others want to say something. Yeah, I, I agree with that. In hindsight, I wished I had been a little bit more selective um, in who I talked to. But on the other hand, I was really glad I like, uh, I, for example, I reached out to Meg. Um, boy, when I when I started to get in a, in a territory that I was uncomfortable with. So I think taking a moment too to reach out to colleagues in your network um, is a really good good idea, especially if they if if um, you know as as uh, Meg and Ruth both highlighted, um, reporters tend to want to extrapolate the findings well outside the domains that they're intended to represent, um, and so that starts to put the um, the focus on territories that may be outside of your um, your academic comfort zone. And at that point, it's I think it's worthwhile reaching out to colleagues who are who are specialists in in those um, areas. And then I think the other thing I'll say that. Um, today, especially in the age of social media and the rate at which information can spread, um, you know, I think I, it's a good idea to be, to have sort of a, a, a presence in, in social media, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, and you, like, I, I'm not much of a user of those things. I'm not active on that, but I was glad I had those accounts set up because like my friends and stuff would would send me something and say, hey, Randy, did you, did you see this? Like, this is going some weird direction. And then I would very quickly send you know, a one line tweet into the conversation and we could kind of cut it off from going like just totally, totally haywire. Um, so I thought that was, um, that would be one piece of advice I would say is, you know, maintain those sort of social media accounts. You don't have to be super active, but when you, when you publish a paper that's starting to get some attention, um, you know, it's worthwhile keeping track of, of what's happening. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, there is another question from June Sinceri, who says, thank you all for this wonderful talk. Did participating in the drive with your community partners substantially change the way that you understand the human animal dynamics that are part of past lived experiences? By extension, did it change the way you wanna write about it or otherwise present it to the public? Great question. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. It did, it, it, it really changed. Um, I mean, the, the archaeological discovery and, and the participating in those drives really changed everything. Um, I, you know, I, I showed that picture of me as a child, um, <laughs> uh, the hunting regalia. I, I come from a, um, um, from a family that, um, um, where hunting is a distinctly male, um, male activity. Um, my, my cousins, my male cousins, uncles always participated in it. My female cousins were always excluded. Um, and I always thought in my mind that, you know, hunting was a male activity from that experience. And that was sort of uh, in ethnography too, looking at the ethnographic writings um, that was also supported there. So I actually came at this sort of thinking about this uh, from, from that perspective um, that, that 
that this was really very much a, a male activity. But then we found the, made the archaeological discovery, and then I participated in these, um, they're called chakus, these vicuña um, drives that happen every year in the Andean Altiplano. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I think it really took some of those observations to really kick me out of that way of thinking. I think the other thing that also kicked me out of that way of thinking was really all the great, great scholarship, the great theory um, that I was forced to read in graduate school that I didn't think would be all that important maybe at the time I didn't appreciate, but I had some really wonderful um, theory teachers that had me read works by people like um, Dr. Conkey, Dr. Tringham and, and others that really um, set the stage for me to be able to recognize when certain observations didn't fit my understanding of, of the world. Um, and, and the drive was certainly a part of that. Yeah, I'll just um, <clears throat> add that um, Christine Hastorf also in discussing the lead up to this, um, uh, doing this, uh, director of the ARF pointed out a wonderful uh, thing that she found uh, of, of a woman or women in um, the Nordic countries who use a particular kind of whistling or calling uh, to attract deer uh, so that they're, you know, you just don't have to have these weapons uh, in order to attract game. And also the discovery of netting techniques, even at 26,000 years ago in Europe, suggests that, you know, anybody can again, you know, use a net and again, much more group rather than this hyper individualistic kind of approach that we Americans tend to take uh, to the way in which human groups work. So the communal drives, uh, which are well known among many Native American groups, the use of nets, uh, the use of calling techniques and so forth to identify and find, uh, find game. So I, I think we really, again, you know, the whole notion of what hunting is, is that it's somebody standing there with a big spear and, and then that's that. And it's just so limited and limiting in terms of our thinking about what human beings are all about. Well, I think that's a wonderful uh, tone to end on. So thanks very much for that. Um, and thanks again uh, to all of our wonderful speakers and hope to see many of you next week. Thanks, Lucy. All right. Thanks again, Randy. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Megan and Ruth.